So here we are. D-Web and Civil Society, an introduction for makers. Thank you all for joining us. It's the beginning of a, a learning series about D-Web and Civil Society, blockchain, decentralized, decentralized tech, cryptocurrencies, dApps. We hear these terms. Some of us know them better than others. And this program is all about exploring the ins and outs of these concepts and ideas and more specifically how all of this technology is used in civil society. This is the first of a series of webinars. Our expert speaker, Gloria, will take you through the fundamentals and answer questions like, what is D-Web and why is it important for makers? What are blockchains? How does blockchain tech enable decentralization and more? You'll be able to ask questions of Gloria and our uh, subject matter expert and as we go, and there'll be a Q&A at the end. My name is Billy Bickett. I'm here from TechSoup. On behalf of the whole crew at TechSoup, we want to welcome you. TechSoup is a bridge builder. We're building a bridge between the technology world and civil society. We've been doing this work since 1987, and we believe in harnessing technology for a more equitable world. We're a mission-driven 501c3 nonprofit with headquarters in San Francisco, offices in London and Warsaw, and a network of partners in over 50 countries around the world. Today, we're diving deep into this theme of decentralized technology, decentralized web, and the theme of open discovery and experimentation. Open discovery and experimentation. We're here because we believe that the, the D-Web isn't just a buzzword or a fad. It's a way of working, a way of problem solving that emphasizes openness and collaboration and is relevant to those of us working in civil society. I wanted to share a little background our, on our intent around this learning series for those of you who want to participate week after week in the coming two months. Uh, the, the real goal of the series is to create the conditions that enable the builders of public good technology, we call them makers, and the civil society integrators, people like those of us at TechSoup who have our hands on building public good tech, and those of you at nonprofits all around the world. We're trying to help you all harness emerging technologies for the public good. We want to help you do it early and effectively and responsibly. That's the goal. And in terms of the programmatic attributes, the way we've designed this program, we've taken a really intentional approach to do some of these things. This is, for the most part, a peer-to-peer. -peer, it's designed to be a peer-to-peer -peer learning experience. We're going to demystify the D-Web with expert-led community events like this one, workshops and learning materials. We've invited, this thing is going to be inclusive and diverse. We've invited voices from all corners of the web and the world to ensure that every organization has a voice in this discussion. In terms of ethics and safety, we feel like the ethics conversation and safety conversations should be baked into the program. And so we want to have an open conversation with you all and dialogue about the challenges and the risks that you are seeing and how to navigate them. Constructive and iterative, we, we welcome your feedback and it's basically going to inform our program roadmap. So please bring the feedback. We're going to have polls at the end of every event and uh, we're going to read them closely and shape the future of the, the, the follow-on events based on your feedback. Um, transparency, we're open source whenever possible. You could check out our GitHub, which will hold all of the materials we're building for the program. Eli, if you could drop that in the Slack, that would be excellent. Enabling connections and unlocking networks. There's a Slack channel for you to continue the conversation, this conversation with peers and get support from TechSoup. And so you can join that Slack channel. We'll put that in the chat as well. We'll also be opening uh, an exclusive forum for makers uh, later in the year. Humility, it's not acknowledged enough in the technology world. And so we want to acknowledge it forthrightly here. We want to basically just acknowledge our limitations in terms of knowledge, the limits of our own experiences. We're all limited in knowledge and experience to a certain degree, and we all have limits in terms of our own perspectives. And so we're bringing a commitment to a humility to this program. And so we invite the same from everyone participating. Finally, connecting members to resources. So for those of you who have some big ideas about your own decentralized technology, 
great. We are, we want to hear from you because we're going to be organizing a series of funder roundtables to get makers in front of funders and have a conversation about the next generation of technology development in civil society. And so if you're building something for civil society, that's the D web tool or adapt, we want to hear from you and please, please uh, stay tuned for more about our funder roundtable series. Whether you're a returning uh, webinar uh, participant or this is your first time, I just want to say thank you for uh, joining us and um, thank you to the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web for supporting uh, this project. And finally, without further ado, I want to welcome Gloria. Gloria Kambala is a renowned tech leader specializing in quadratic funding regenerative crypto economics, DAOs, and inclusive financial structures. She's a techno technical advisor on the board of directors for the Black Women Blockchain Council, recognized as one of the top 10 women in fintech. She's also a speaker and mentor, sharing her expertise in empowering marginalized voices through hackathons and social justice causes. She's really passionate about using technology to amplify diverse voices and promote economic empowerment and when she's not working, you can find Gloria coding with her sons, practicing yoga, or playing playing the drums. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pass the mic to Gloria. Hi, Billy. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here, y'all. So I will just say thank you again to the TechSoup team for having me here. I have been in this space for a while, and I will just say that this presentation is very high level, but we can go down a whole bunch of rabbit holes, and that's the way that it's designed to be. Just to let you know, it's going to be very much like a fundamental aspect of what is the foundations of decentralized web, what is blockchains, what are dApps, things of that nature. But I've been in this space since 2017, and so I'm more than happy to dive deep into any topics that you have. Also, I believe that this space is should be welcoming to everybody and that there are no question that is a dumb question. So if you do have questions, please ask it in the chat and I will make sure that your question gets answered. If not, I'll just ask some questions as well, but I'm sure that I'm not always explaining it at 110%. So if you do have questions, it's totally normal. Feel free to ask. Awesome. So a little bit about me. I am a hacker by trade. My background is always in hackathons. I've been build, building and making in this blockchain space, specifically Ethereum, since 2017. Fun fact was that on my maternity leave, I had a little bit of extra time. So I would watch the core developers call and figure out how to build blockchains while I was nursing my little guy. And that's what I did for fun. So I have no clue about anything else that happened outside of that world, but I do know a lot about blockchain. <laughs> I worked on GetCoin's hackathon team, which means that I either lead, facilitate, organize somewhere about 40 different hackathons, which is where builders come together to build Web3. And I do that about 40 hackathons a year. I've been doing that since 2020. And I was a GetCoin employee number eight. So I've been through different type of token launches, DAO launches, building a product, and just living within this decentralized web space. So I have a lot of learnings and I was, we were early in it. We just had to learn as we were doing. That is me in a hunch. So let's talk about some blockchains. Let's get the fundamental, under, and the fundamental underlining understanding about blockchain. Uh, one thing that I would love for y'all to understand is that these concepts aren't brand new. Sometimes these concepts you've seen in some aspect of your life in one way or another, or the application is just new um, to the technology per se. So uh, don't be too afraid of the technology or the, even the words about it. Um, there are things where you've probably interacted with something that's decentralized already, um, but it may or may not be a blockchain itself. Let's dive in. Okay, so what are blockchains? Uh, blockchains are just a distributed or decentralized ledger technology that's used to like record transactions and data. Um, and it's great because they're the foundations of the technology. It's the foundations of the technology behind 
the cryptocurrencies that you might have heard of, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, things of that nature, um, anything that's the digital uh, currency aspect of it. Uh, the cool thing behind blockchains is that they are completely decentralized. They are immutable, which means that they cannot be changed or whatnot. They used all these different consensus mechanisms in order for us to decide, yes, this is true and whatnot. But every copy of the distributed ledger is available to everybody who has the blockchain. I know that there's a whole bunch of words sometimes that are associated with uh, blockchains. And so you have wallets and addresses, uh, networks, you have a trusted state. Blockchains runs on smart contracts, cryptocurrencies and mining. Um, this is all like just verbs that kind of go around within the space, but um, they're all information that's super, just really powerful there. And all pieces of the space itself. How does a blockchain actually work? So what happens with a blockchain is it uses um, a cryptographic method, usually a hash, and it is a person will write a smart, a smart contract that will say, we will agree upon these two different things. And it's going to be sent to an address. That message or hash is going to be encrypted and sent over the network. And then if you're, if you have the right encryption key, you can decrypt the mes message, take a look at it, and then add it, confirm it, and then add it to a block of series, which is a lot easier to understand when it's a little bit more visual. <laughs> so hold on one second. So this is kind of like how a block would actually work. Um, you have a block, which will be uh, the cryptographic hash or you know, um, the, the encrypted um, hash on it, a timestamp, a notch, um, the hash of the block or which block it's actually in and the actual like message about it. And then that block, when you have um, the block of information, we say, okay, this is the Genesis block. This is the very first block. Uh, and then you'd go um, through miners or whatnot to sit there and sit, try to find like an algorithm that says, yes, this is the state of the block. And then it would go to the next uh, block of or piece of information in the, the ledger, um, and which will be the second block. And so there's constantly adding new blocks each time a proof of work or each time a solution is found from a miner or is validated, it goes to the next block of work. So they're continually each time to add blocks onto the transactions. And then each of the information, as far as like where is the information of that information listed in, is in a block hash, where it tells you where everything lives. As things are transparent, everything will have an address or a hash address or a sender address, all that information lives very publicly, but you can go back and see where the data is based on the block header or the information that you've received that way. So there's a couple different types of blockchains. You can have very public blockchains, which would be your Ethereum's, your Bitcoin's, your public ledgers that Everybody has the um, copy of it and it's just like out in the open. And if you're running a local node, then you also have the access to the information. Um, or you can have things that are like private ledgers, like um, a hyperledger type thing um, or some even um, smaller type ledgers there. You have L2s, which are layer twos, which are side chains that run like on top of different blockchains. And those those are all decided when... And uh, you're building your blockchain per se about how open or closed you are. It's really the protocol that's going to be able to decide whether it's going to be like a permissioned blockchain or a permissionless blockchain, or it's just going to be like accessed to, to everybody. So that the level of trust that you have during that time or how well it's going to scale or how transparent it's going to be are all things that you're going to be considering when you're going to be like building your chain per se, or what chain you're going to be building on and the use case that you're going to need for your application that you're going to build. So how do these all kind of communicate with each other? They communicate via a thing that's called a smart contract. 
and a sm smart contract is completely decentralized execution wise. It can run all by itself. Uh, it's a code based contract. It runs, if you're using Ethereum, it runs with Solidity and it's all in the code. An example of a smart contract could be like a voting contract or a, a ICO contract, a token contract, where it would be like if someone for a voting contract, it could be something where if you had a couple votes, then you would vote it for your candidate and then your vote would be gone and it would all be like all on chain. All the voting would happen all on chain and you would sign your signature, which would be your ETH address. And then someone else could, would sign their signature as it being a valid vote and then it would go and the votes would be tallied and, and finalized. The cool thing about smart contracts is it can be completely autonomized. If you are trying to figure out a budget of an org and said that if this one proposal got 15 votes in it, then we would go ahead and release $100 out into the rest of the org for this project. All of that could be autonomized and you wouldn't have to have people in the middle of it, like issuing out the check or anything like that. You can just automate the whole thing. Perfect. Okay, so what's decentralization? So I think sometimes when we deal with tech, we had the centralized school of tech, which is like when you have a server room and some data center and all of your computers have to deal with the server room. And if the server room goes down, then the site goes down or things of that nature happen. But within decentralization, everybody has a is running an instance of the server locally on their own servers. So you're not, if one server goes down in China, you still have the same information on everyone else's uh, node all over the place, which is great because it means that there is a level of um, security where you can't take down the whole like system per se on that one. But there's also um, an aspect of everything being accessible then for people. You can just run your own local node and have everything. So the way that blockchain uh, enables decentralization is it shifts all of the power from the centralized authorities into the power into the people itself or to the communities that are running the blockchains or the organizations or just the communities themselves, the decision makers themselves. So in the old school, the type of thing. It's like the power goes back to the people is how I always say it in my mind and um, where the people then can be the deciding factors on um, what they want to do uh, with the currencies or what they want to do with protocol or how they want to vote or pretty much anything from that perspective, the power is back in, in, in the people's hands rather than having the power back into a centralized authority's hands or a centralized system's hands. Um, and so with that, you can see implications done like where around the world where there are countries where like currencies might not be as stable. You have people depending more on cryptocurrencies or whatnot because the current the cryptocurrency has a level of transparency that they can rely a little bit more in and stability and have access to a little bit better too. Let's see. And so, yeah, decentralized models have greater security, more transparency and autonomy, which is awesome. And they're much more censorship resistant, which is crucial as well. Let's see. One of the benefits for things being like decentralized in that aspect is you can always um, see the history of what has happened within the blockchain. When you're Having a blockchain that is immutable means that there's always a history of it that lives permanently within the decentralized web, which means that all the transactions you can always look on Etherscan or on whatever type of scanning uh, system you have for whichever type of um, blockchain you're using and see the history of that transaction and like who it went to, what the transaction was for and things of that nature, which means like within the, the whole aspect of Bitcoin, 
and the fact that nobody knows who like Satoshi is, you can always go back to the original block and see, okay, this is where blockchain started. And if someone uh, wanted to claim that they were Satoshi, all they had to do was like present like the private key that's associated to the public wallet that the first blockchain had gone to. And then they would be able to show that they were like Satoshi Nakamoto. But I think in reality, I like that Satoshi is not known who he is because then it just allows us all to be a little bit sub of a Satoshi and that all of these pillars of decentralization, immutability, trust, that's all accessible for all of us. And we're all like little Satoshis in my mind. So I hope we never know who that is. But back to decentralization. Decentralization has the distributed ledger, which is the peer, allows for the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge network, where as long as I have your ETH address or any type of decentralized web address, as long as I have your blockchain address and you have my blockchain address, I can send the payments peer-to-peer -peer rather than having to go through an intermediary. So if I wanted to give you a couple of tokens, I could just take your address and then give you the tokens. I wouldn't have to go through a bank or whatnot like you do with a traditional banking system. The consensus mechanisms are the way that we decide the state of the blockchain and what if it's correct. And so there's two main uh, ways to to really look at the state of the block and say, okay, this is where the block is currently and we're going to move on to the next block. Uh, one of them is that proof of work mechanism where we're using like a mathematic equation and whoever solves that mathematic equation first wins this pool. It's what miners and validators are, are called. And then you have a proof of stake consensus mechanism as well, which is a little bit different than proof of work, but that's okay too. Once you have those mechanisms and consensus is decided, then you can go ahead and move on to the group as a whole moves to the next block and continues to put all of the transaction data and whatnot in that block until another validation is done and then it moves on to the next block too. So another fun aspect of decentralization is decentralized govern governance, which means that you can have a lot of people, you can vote in a way, way that is much more distributed, whereas if you hold like a token or you hold some piece of that org, uh, you can take uh, into consideration the voting of that org. Um, and it can be like a one-to-one -one voting or one-to-many voting, depending on how much of the tokens are like somewhat allocated. But also you can... Um, you could take your voting piece and give it to and delegate it to somebody else and allow for them to vote on your behalf. Um, but, which if you do like the way that they vote, then you continue to let them delegate your tokens on their behalf. But um, if you don't like what they're, the way they're voting, um, you can actually take your token back and move it to another person. This is so different from the way that we traditionally vote, where you might not like your senators or whatnot, or how they're, they are continuing to vote, but you're stuck with them voting the way that they vote, and you hope they continue to vote that way. Where in decentralized governance, per se, um, if you don't like the way that someone's voting, you can just take your voting token back and then put it towards someone else that it votes the way you want to. So it gives, again, more power back to the people. Yeah, so there's a lot there to be said. <laughs> okay, so within this whole decentralized landscape, then there are some really broad impacts <laughs> into uh, civil society. And I would love to either we could dive deep into these or start to talk about them. But there are, we've been seeing them be used, blockchain technology be used quite a bit. Um, we see it in the empowerment of individuals and communities. It can empower people in multiple different ways. Again, like it brings a layer of trust and transparency. So if you think of communities that traditionally didn't have trust or transparency, the blockchain technology and the apps built upon it allows for an open door into some of those issues to be resolved and some innovation to be built upon 
those pillars. So you see people where financial structures or government structures need to have more transparency. There, you see a lot more builder innovation around those type of pillars there. It can be things like I've seen things around reforestation or things of that nature, things around beach cleanups. We've seen different type of technologies, just even around builders who maybe didn't have the infrastructure for technology in their local communities for a workplace, and then seeing them work within Web3. Um, they now have a, a way that they can work and engage with the broader communities there too. There's a little bit of that aspect of it. There's a lot of empowerments of artists and non-traditional tech makers as well I'm bringing into the space too. Uh, promotion for diversity. Uh, the great thing with things being decentralized is that, and especially that they're community driven, is that if you find a community that you're passionate about, you can go ahead and join. So these communities tend to be a lot less uh, borderless. And so you're working with people from all across the world that also happen to um, want to um, be aligned with your purpose or your cause that you're building on the blockchain. So I could say if we were talking about clean water and the importance of clean rivers, you could have people from all over the world working on either proposals or art or tokens or whatever around clean water and having their research and their viewpoint uh, come into play as well. Sometimes we see this in like a, the decentralized science communities where solutions that are um, applied in, let's say, the Amazon can also be tried and tested in the Congo. And so there's just a, a communication of a, a share of knowledge back and forth that's available now um, because of the, the decentralization aspect of it and the openness that um, people didn't have access to before. Um, yeah, there's also like faster response to local issues. Um, when, uh, we thought of something like Ukraine now, so when the, the war in Ukraine started, uh, it was very quickly, people were able to, um, give and donate to the war in Ukraine because they had the Ukraine DAO address that people could just donate some tokens to right away. But also DAOs are able to form somewhat quickly and have people contribute to it. So people are able to share their needs uh, within real time and see like what information um, people needed done uh, right away. And people were able to jump in and help, which is great when you start to think of like disasters and emergencies when people want to provide help and uh, on one side of the, of the things and then on the other side, people need uh, access to the help. So. Yeah, Let's see. So the distribution, this is solely by bearing nodes and you'll be able to see that uh, a node again is the decentralized aspect of a blockchain running an instance into it. That these blockchains are global, the, the nodes are running really pretty much global. There are different types of adoption that happens like in global south versus global north and access to different funds and funding opportunities. But there are, the actual communities that are builders and, and makers are all over the world. And there are events that are happening all over the world uh, all the time, too, that are um, happening. But the other side about this is that you don't have to be solely in a location that has like a huge community running in it. For me, where we're in Gitcoin, we have Green Pill. There's green pill locations all over, and it starts with just one person, and they continue to grow. But even those locations start to learn from each other and start to get wiser. So it's being part of a local community, but also being part of uh, global uh, solutions as well. Let's see. So let's talk cryptocurrencies. So again, blockchains are what powers the actual cryptocurrencies, and I know a lot of people have questions usually with cryptocurrencies themselves. So a cryptocurrency is just like a, a digital virtual currency or crypto that's used for security that operates on blockchain technology. 
some of those cryptocurrencies are like a Bitcoin or Ethereum, a I can't even think of it. Litecoin. There's a whole bunch of different cryptocurrencies out there. It's just what I consider like a digital asset, a digital currency that's being able to go back and forth. That value of the currency is dictated by one of two things. It's either like a stable coin where it's just pegged to something, sometimes the US dollar, or it can be decided based on like scarcity, like how much there is out there and the demand that's brought up by the community itself. That is like how the prices, what drives the prices up and down. So something like Bitcoin, where that's driven by scarcity, they'll only have a certain amount of it at some time. And the scarcity is what drives the rate up, like the public perception of the scarcity is what drives the price up or down. Let's see. Okay, so this is really, I guess this would have been helpful before just to figure out the Bitcoin side of it. But again, you get, in order to have um, a Bitcoin, you'd have a, a transaction. It would go from one peer to another peer. So if I had um, Billy's address, let's just say it was like Billy.eth and he needed to eat, I would be at Gloria.eth and I would send it to eat to Billy.eth. Um, that transaction would then be, um, put into this whole uh, computer that's going to be able to solve this hash or this equation that's going to then spit out a verification hash too. And then once it said, yes, it's a legitimate transaction, it's going to go in the block. It's going to be recognized by the blockchain and go through the series of chains uh, that are there and be completed. So it's a little process. At the end of that process, Belly would then have my two ETH. And I would have two less ETH, and that would be the state of our block or the state of the wallets too. How do cryptocurrencies really, what, where do they serve within our society currently? They can serve within a lot of different aspects. There's like your digital identity that you can have is, uh, can be used on the blockchain. It can be a stored value. It can be digital cash. It can be um, micro payments. It can be some decentralized finance aspects of it, where that's a whole nother rabbit hole to get into that I probably won't get into just now. But it can allow for quite a bit of things. If you are traveling or whatnot and you want to pay something, a lot of times paying for it in uh, crypto might be a little bit easier than uh, having to constantly change currencies. Um, and holding currencies that way. So there's quite a bit of opportunities that you have there. And so these are some of the real life use cases that people currently have within the blockchain sphere, whether it's payments, enterprise railways, land registries, they have it for art, they have your wallet management, energy uses. There's a lot of real life uh, current blockchain uses that people are using. And yeah, this is how you would go ahead and buy it. So you're going to, if you were to buy it, you'd buy it on an exchange, on a, a crypto exchange, and you would choose the type of currency that you'd want to buy. You'd go on an exchange and enter your amount that you'd want to buy in front of it. You'd have to deposit the funds, so you'd have to either buy your funds either with using it via bank or some type of way. You get your funds, you place your order, you'd confirm it, and then you'd secure it within your wallet, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then you track your investment and you keep it for your own details. And buying it or selling it would work in reverse where you would talk about the crypto that you'd want to exchange. You'd trade it into your traditional uh, section and usually selling your crypto back into either exchanging it into a new crypto or off offboarding it into a bank again. And then you would tap your transaction details and confirm your identity and make your funds go back to your bank or to your wallet, um, always keeping your funds secure. So there's two ways that you can hold your crypto. You can hold it in a hard wallet, which is like a ledger or something, 
like that, where you could store it in a safe or something of, of that nature, where it's a little bit off your phone. Or you can do it in a hard, in a soft wallet, which is like in a phone or in a device or whatnot. That's a little bit still connected to our technology. And depending on people's beliefs, it's always great to have some funds in a soft wallet, but to store a, a large amount of it in a, in a hard wallet, if that's the case. But uh, it's always up to uh, y'all the way that you decide to, to store it. The most important thing to remember when dealing with your, your wallets is your private keys. And so just like in traditional banking, when you have your ATM card and you never tell anyone your PIN in crypto or in blockchain spaces, you never share your private keys. Private keys are the access, this is the way that we can access uh, your funds. And so it's really important that you secure your private keys which also means not storing them in like a Word document on your computer or something like that, where someone else can very easily just have access to it. Um, sometimes it's just nice to have it on a piece of paper stored in the safe as well or something of that way so that um, it's a little bit more secure for y'all. Okay, so we did talk about sending crypto. All right, let's talk about dApps. Okay, so dApps are are decentralized applications that are built on protocols. And protocols are like, if you're old school techie like me, they're the railways that make the technology work. It's all the stuff behind the scenes. And I always like to say nobody cares about protocols <laughs> uh, unless you're someone who loves protocols. So just in the internet, there's a TCIP or TCPIP call where it's just the way information moves back and forth and it's like the handshakes that happen. But we don't really care. We just care that our internet works. The protocols are somewhat the same in that it's the way that crypto works. But the cool thing with crypto protocols or decentralized web protocols is that you can actually get really involved in protocol development and actually get involved in what's happening with the protocols. You can vote on things that are happening with things because there is that transparent layer and it's all built in the open that if you don't like the way something is happening within the blockchain space, you can actually give your two cents and have some influences into the protocols themselves. The protocols are can be, Coin has its one protocol, Ethereum has their protocol, Ethereum Classic is different than Ethereum, Cardano has their protocols, and it's just like a group of people who build it in a specific way. And if something was to happen or changes need to be made, they have their consensus and then say, okay, um, we're either going to split and do this protocol is going to follow this one way. And then this other protocol is going to follow um, this other pro protocol, which is what happens when the things have a fork. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different protocols out there that you can decide to build on and be part of those communities as well. And if you really want to get into protocol engineering, let me know the Ethereum protocol engineering groups. They have a great community. It's very open and you can just watch the core developer calls and it'll tell you what's happening within the protocol at all time. Okay, so dApps are built on, type, on top of these protocols. And just on your phone, when you have your phone, you have your app store where you can play games or whatnot. Um, within the blockchain space, these are called dApps. And these are decentralized applications that you can build, um, that you can play on or utilize to. So those could be like an NFT collections like CryptoKitties. It can be Uniswap tools that help you deal with decentralized exchanges. It can be MetaMax, which are different types of wallets. There's a lot of different apps that you can have that are built or dApps that you can have within a, a protocol that are built. And you can find those all in in like the browser on MetaMask that you are going to be using. And again, the benefits of DAP, sorry, it's decentralized, it's um, immutable, you have global access, and you can be part of different communities. There's a lot of benefits. In general, there's lots of challenges within the blockchain decentralized web space. A lot of the times it's, can we scale? Like how easily can we scale? 
privacy can be an issue from some perspectives. In some ways, things are super private. In other ways, it's all out in the open, so it's not. The energy consumption is something that we are always aware of. And so there's different blockchains like Filecoin Green that are always doing research in order to try to take into consideration the consumption levels and try to be at a net zero state. And then aspects of just access, adoptability, things of that side, high latency, the amount of time. We are so used to transactions happening very fast that even though blockchain transactions happen relatively fast, sometimes it's not as fast as we would like. Okay, so this is the aspect of the internet of things of all the different types of dApps that are out there that you could take a look at and what they're like. On the left side, it would be like what they're and what on the right is what they are. But as you can see, there are a growing use cases for dApps at all times and opportunities. Gaming is huge within the decentralized web space, music, art, lending, web. There's a lot of different sides of it infrastructure, lots of niche kind of places for people to build on. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the promise. So what are the programming languages that are being used? If you're doing within Ethereum, you have Solidity, which is, uh, it reminds me a lot of JavaScript. You have Rust for those who are in Polkadot and Solidana. You have C if you're going to be on the client side. You have yeah, JavaScript for the dApps. For the Ethereum community, you have Go, which is more for the client side and for Hyperledger. Python can be used for different scripting aspects. Hyperledger does use, Hyperledger and Cardano use a Java. And then the low level ones, I think it's more for the EVM, will be using things like Lisp. And Simplicity is Bitcoin and Tezos. So that is it from that aspect of it. As far as things to do challenge-wise, it's like there are always spaces for all different types of makers in this space. If you are someone who is technical or creative and you want to continue to build, I always say go to Biddlebox. We're building the future of Web3 where people get paid to pay their open source contributions. And we can take a look at what that looks like. But if you also want to continue to, this is getting paid to contribute to open source. <laughs> And that's just some of the prizes that we've done on Biddlebox. So if you're someone who is a maker, definitely check out those places because people get paid for their innovation all the time. But if not, uh, contribute on Gitcoin grants rounds. There's a lot of great orgs and nonprofits that are uh, earning crypto, that are being able to shill with the rest of the world what they're doing. And uh, people are able to contribute to their causes all the time and get coin uh, grants rounds is a great place to have your impact happen quadratically, which we uh, can touch on later as well. But I want to make sure I save some time for your questions and make sure that we get to dive deep into those that want to stop sharing. And Billy, if we have some questions to go through, I would love to do that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gloria, for that really comprehensive overview of uh, the scene here. Let's, let's see if there are open questions still. I saw Anne answering a, a number of questions in the chat at the moment. It looks John has a question about Bitcoin, ETH, and uh, ADA all have public consensus mechanisms is the question. Is that right? Yes. So they're public, they all are public consensus me mechanisms. And I know that Bitcoin is proof of work. I can't remember if we've moved from proof of work to proof of stake yet with Ether. It will take me a moment, but they all have public consensus mechanisms for there. Correct. Great. And it is aid, uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry, one second. Go ahead. Uh, if you had something else, Gloria. Oh, uh, no, I just see some great, thank you, Anne, for jumping in and answering some of these uh, questions that are there. Um, one of the ones that I saw was like, let's see, is if you start with a private blockchain, can it be made public later? Now, if your blockchain is private, it's private. And if it's public, you can you have to decide which one you want to make then, which is why understanding what you want to build is more important than just trying to build it and change it later. So, yeah. Great. We, we, we want to save space for any other questions for those of you who didn't ask questions in the chat, please uh, feel free to drop into the chat now with any questions that are coming up for you. 
And I know that, okay, can these networks, if private, be built on AWS virtual server environments? Okay. Yes. Oddly enough, yes, they can be built on AWS. The private ones can. We've had AWS sponsor a couple of our hackathons before, too, and have some of those aspects of it. There are some aspects where it can be used on AWS and, and have that be utilized, too, if it's private. <laughs> awesome. Great. We're going to go once, twice, and three times for last calls for questions. I know there's a lot that will continue to be discussed in the series. So hopefully, as you all continue to have questions, like you can feel free to reach out to me or anybody else that's in the series to answer your questions. Like that is absolutely awesome. Um, this is, again, super high level. So there's a lot of information here that you'll probably be looking into, but there's lots of great resources. So I would definitely encourage you all to continue to reach out to the TechSoup team if you have questions or ask any of the other presenters that are coming up because I know from their backgrounds too that they uh, have a lot of insight as well. And Gloria, where can uh, people reach you if they have, if they'd like to reach you for anything? Yeah, I else? am a super public person. G. Kambwala, either on Twitter or Telegram or LinkedIn or anywhere it will get you access to me. And um, But if you want to send me an email, it's just gkambwala at gmail.com. That's the best. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to just share screen. I have a couple closing closing comments, but thank you so much, Gloria, for making the time and educating us and bringing your insights and experience to this community. We really appreciate it. For those of you who our first timers, welcome. And for those of you who are repeat members, uh, thank you for coming back. We, we're going to be doing this for, we're going to do in these events. We're producing these events probably once a week for the next couple of months. And we'll also be doing a office hours event to supplement the, the educational events like these for folks who want to do a deeper dive. The next event's happening September 20th at 9 a.m. All the events are happening at the same time, so you can just bookmark 9 a.m. California time on your calendars. If you're interested for the coming couple of months, we're going to look at real-world examples. Today was uh, the foundational concepts of DWeb, uh, and then we're going to move into the details of how innovators are using DWeb in the real world at real organizations to solve real social issues in local communities. So please mark your calendars for that. And thank you so much for attending. After you leave, there's going to be a post-event survey. If you could take a couple of minutes to answer, that will help us improve our events as we go. And thank you again. Have a lovely day. Thank you for spending time with us. We really appreciate it.